All right. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Greenwood. Um, it's it's good to be able to be here, even though it's it's not under the you know the the best of circumstances for myself. We lost last night uh, in the first round of our regional. Uh, game didn't get over till about 9:30. Got home about 11:30. Woke up and left at about 3.15 to get here. So just living a strength coach life, <laughs> you know, those of you that are in the fitness profession know that, you know, it's not always peaches and cream. Um, you know, you're going to have those days where you have to have to do stuff like that, but it's all for the cause. So um, today we're actually playing the Longhorns, so the Aggies that are in the room jump on board our bandwagon. We can we can use the help. Um, Getting, getting started, uh, like you said, I'll, I'll give you a little history on myself. Um, I do come from the Northeast. He started to say Jersey, and I was going to get really angry. Um, I'm, I'm from Maine, so somewhere where no one really knows it is, unless you've been there. Um, I went to undergrad at the University of Southern Maine. I uh, got my bachelor's in sports medicine, uh, concentration in health fitness, so I didn't go the athletic training route. Um, I kind of directed a little bit more towards... Um, you know, we had to take some special populations classes, uh, just general exercise science stuff. Uh, straight out of undergrad, I went and I worked for uh, Mike Boyle um, as an intern for six months during that sum that first summer out of undergrad. Uh, and I'll, I'll go into a little more detail on uh, Coach Boyle here in a little bit, uh, as that was a great experience in my development. Um, next, went to Baylor, as Dr. Greenwood mentioned. Um, this was a place that meant a lot to me for a lot of reasons. Obviously, it gave me the opportunity to continue my education. Um, also gave me the opportunity to have my first um, true volunteer practical experience on the collegiate side of things. So being a Division three athlete, I was a college baseball player myself when I, when I was at the University of Southern Maine. Um, I didn't have a strength coach. So as I got into my junior and senior year of, of college, I was actually my team strength coach uh, as an athlete myself. So that's how I first got into it. Um, so I didn't have any firsthand uh, experience taking direction from a strength coach and feeling what it actually was to be a college athlete under a strength coach. So as, as uh, my transition went to Baylor, that was a huge positive for me. Um, and I met my wife there. So that was probably number one on the list. Um, after that, I went and I worked for uh, the Astros organization for a season. I was a, the strength coach for the AA affiliate in Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, that's where I got to spend a little time with, with Dr. Coleman uh, at, at spring training. Uh, specifically, I spent a, a lot of mornings with him um, early in there in the, in the big league side of things and then transitioned over in the minor league side uh, once our teams were, were kind of split. Um, but that was a really, really positive experience for me. Um, as you can tell, he has a wealth of knowledge that I was able to to kind of pick his brain on, um, and that was uh, that was a, that was a really important time in my development as well. Um, was fortunate enough to to make connections, which is big in strength conditioning in the profession. Um, is a lot of a lot of who you know, and, and kind of building your network and making that work for you. You know, building upon your education as well. So that's how that's how I got to Florida State. Was my mentor at Baylor, uh, Charlie Melton, who you'll be hearing from later today. Um, he worked for Florida State for a couple years. I think that was his first full-time job. Uh, his director then became my director. So a good word was, was led. I had another uh, student that I was with at Baylor that got offered a job at Florida State. She put in a good word for me. I was offered my first full-time position as the head baseball and golf uh, strength conditioning coach uh, for Florida State in 2011. Uh, so I was there from 2011 to just this past uh, July. Uh, so I was there for three and a half years with Florida State Baseball and Golf. Uh, had some good success there with the baseball team. Uh, more to do with the athlete than, than myself and more to do with the coach, really, which I'll go into a little bit more later as well. Um, and then in August this year, I started at Dallas Baptist. Um, completely different experience, and I'll go into that a little bit more uh, later as well. So. My developmental background, it's, it's the same with all of us. I think that we're all a product of others' investment in us. So it starts when you're a kid. Your mom and your dad feed you or else you're not going to grow, right? It's, you, you take that and you, you use that in your professional network building, uh, having mentors. Uh, personally, for me, all of these guys I'm going to go into to further detail about uh, just in developing what, what made me as a coach. I think when you're looking at my, at my title of my presentation, it's, 
It's building a complete strength and conditioning program from past experiences and then taking a present reality and applying what you've already learned um, from whether it be things in college, things not in college, like, like uh, Dr. Coleman mentioned. Uh, all of it has its place, but all of these guys uh, had a really strong impact on my life. Um, and I'm going to give you some takeaway stuff, uh, and it should be on your handout as well, um, from each of those guys, that what they taught me. So these are just mine. Uh, so my requisites of complete program development. Number one is personal development as a transformational leader and mentor. So if you get mentored yourself, you know the importance of it. So if, if it's done in the right way, it's not done with someone yelling at you to, to wipe down the benches, to reset the racks to proper position. Um, it's them laying responsibility on you, delegating to implement certain um, periods of your, your daily training session, um, running a warm up, leading whatever it is. Um, as a mentor, you're transforming someone's life and it's not just in, in those kind of things, it's, it's in your personal interaction with them as well. So uh, leaders, are very important to have um, and I think development as a leader is just almost as important as development as uh, as a coach and it goes really hand in hand. Um, number two, vision uh, leading into opportunity and, and ending with execution. Um, so all of those things are integral to, to completing what you what you put in, in motion. So you have to have a vision for what you want to do. Um, I didn't know that I would really be a head strength coach, which is what I am. I have one GA, he's, he's here today. Um, I didn't know I'd be a head at you know, 30 years old, which is what I am now. Um, but everything I've done so far has kind of led up to it. Um, and I've had the vision of what I would want it to be when I got to, to that position. Um, and, and we'll kind of go over that a little bit later. Um, so the vision is first, you then have to have your opportunity to, to put that into motion and you have to execute it. Execution is, is the biggest part. You know, you have to have the people around you um, and all of that to, to actually make things happen. Number three, individual sport and athlete assessment. So I know you're probably going to hear a little bit more today about uh, different ways of assessment and implementing what you learn or glean for information from assessment, um, but I'll tell you what I do uh, and what it means to me in our program. Um, so number one for me, movement, obviously movement quality trumps everything. Um, you're going to look at how proficient are they, how efficient are they, um, and ultimately those two things are going to lead to mastery of movement. So those two things leading into the mastery you're going to see in functional movement screening, dynamic warm-up, um, barbell complexes, all of those things that we use as, as screening tools uh, before we actually load them in certain exercises. Uh, number four, programming and template development. Um, so I'm going to mention progression and regression models, uh, how I build a template based upon progression and regression models, uh, and then uh, template development, and I'll, I'll show a couple slides of a sample template uh, for, for what I had for a baseball offseason uh, this year. I am a past baseball player, so it's going to be tough for me not to reference baseball a lot, even though now I'm, you know, head of 13 NCAA sports. Um, it's hard to get away from the true passion. Um, Next, I'm going to just go into these guys and what, what they did in my life. Um, this guy at the University of Southern Maine was an athletic trainer. Uh, since I was in the sports medicine program, um, I spent a lot of time with him. And he actually was a guy that, that was the big challenger in my life. So I came out of high school. Um, what I have here, skinny, excuse-making, oft-injured, low talent, 78 to 82 miles an hour is what I called low talent uh, as a Maine baseball player, very, very average. Um, and I was on the bench my freshman year as, in, in a Division three school, so I was not a player. Um, I, I, was an, I was, you know, had a desire to play, um, and he saw that, and he invested in me. Um, what he did with it helped me get less skinny, okay? So um, I, I graduated high school at about 150 pounds, never touched a weight in my life, got to college, uh, embraced strength training because of what you know, he had taught me with what it, what it means to your development. He had worked in professional baseball, uh, so that really helped as well. It made me become really self-reflecting, um, and I ultimately ended up in my junior and senior years as a, a starting pitcher, uh, the top end of our, our rotation, um, and I went from, you know, 80 miles an hour up to, to 90 miles an hour in my last year. So uh, training meant a lot to me, and that's kind of how I rolled into it. So how he did it, mainly is, is the main takeaway for him is he taught me to be an advocate my, advocate for myself. So when I'm implementing my program to my athletes, that's what I want to, to exemplify with them is 
that I became an advocate for myself and that's how you know, I made changes in my own life, is, is I held myself accountable. I obviously had other people around me that were holding me accountable as well, but I became an advocate for myself. Um, other takeaways, tough love is still love. Um, so strength coaches can be a harsh group of people, um, but your athletes need to understand that, that it, comes with, it comes in love. You know, you're just, you're just wanting them to be successful in everything they do. Um, so, you know, you correcting, um, obviously you want to have the best correction method uh, that you can, but tough love is still love. Proactivity is greater than reactivity. Um, he was an athletic trainer, so he had a big prehabilitation injury prevention base. Um, so he taught me a lot of that uh, based around injuries and, and education around your injuries. Uh, and true education requires investment, so both the teacher and the student athlete uh, and the coach. So you have to educate from all areas um, to truly invest in that, in that uh, athlete. Mike Boyle, um, like I said, I worked for him for, for a short time before I had the opportunity to go to Baylor. Um, but he's a man that, that if any of you have, are, are consistent readers of his material, he is very progressive. Um, he questions a lot of things, um, which is one of the greatest things about him. You know, he's a guy that makes you think. Uh, he's a guy that, that doesn't think you're doing a good job unless you are asking him questions. Um, so that was a big check for me as well, is, is when I was going to him, I was a very kind of intrinsic person, not a real loud leader uh, as a strength conditioning coach, um, but I got assigned to work with him. First groups of the day are his pro groups with NHL, NFL, um, elite college hockey guys all in one group, and I'm just standing there as an 18-year-old, or a 23-year-old kid, or 22-year-old kid, um, just kind of deer in the headlights, you know, with... NHL All-Stars, all of these people, um, but he, he laid it out and said, if you're going to work with me, you're going to take notes on anything that you have questions about. If you don't ask a question at the end of the day, I'm going to guess you weren't paying attention. Um, so he taught me a ton. Um, I have down here fixed versus growth mindset, and that's what I just kind of explained. He, he was of the growth mindset, uh, not the fixed. So fixed mindset, they don't ask questions, they go with the flow, they look to others worse than than them to make themselves feel better and growth mindset on the other side uh, as they seek to understand they, they demonstrate poise under adverse situations and they look to others better than them to learn and grow so you can you can put yourself in one of those boxes um, and I can tell you which ones are going to be successful uh, and which ones are going to make the strides faster than the other uh, other takeaways from coach Boyle is if you stop learning you stop growing uh, you must avoid the, the urge to try to put square square pegs into round holes you've probably seen articles written with that as the tagline um, you know, if you're trying to um, back squat a veteran NBA player whose kneecaps come up to halfway up my quad, you know, you're probably trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Okay, so that can go with exercise selection. That can go with, um, you know, assessment methods. It can, it can kind of cross boundaries. Um, CNS techniques. So this was a huge thing for him as well is... Um, you know, his program was always changing, modifying to the individual, um, but he, he really got across to people that if I'm ever adding something, I know that something else is going to have to give in the process, okay? So we're not overtaxing the CNS system um, to keep these athletes fresh because obviously they're coming for an off-season program where the sky is the limit for them. Um, being progressive doesn't come without resistance uh, and programming templates and progression. So I, I took a lot of my probably... I would say auxiliary progressions um, from, from Coach Boyle and some of my core lifting um, selections, you know, like Dr. Coleman mentioned, um, shying away from back squat in some areas uh, because of limiting factors using Bulgarians or real Fidelity split squats instead. Um, front squat variations, safety bar, cambered bar, all of these different things, um, you know, are things that he taught me on when and where to use them. Uh, and that was a great experience with Coach Boyle. Dr. Greenwood, I, I'm really slow on um, catching up with TV, so Parks and Rec has been on forever. But I look at anyone with a mustache and I automatically compare him to Ron Swanson, his Parks and Rec. So that's why I have this picture up here. So uh, Dr. Greenwood did play a, play a huge part uh, in, in my development, just in giving me the opportunity to, to come to Baylor. Um, and I have the quote down here, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. Um, I put that down only because, you know, you can see it as luck to, to be put in a position to, to 
get a job, to get a graduate assistant offer, um, to keep your progression going in your career. But really what's getting you to that position is you being marketable to that organization or to that school. Um, you know, so I set myself up by taking a GRE, contacting schools before I you know, was getting into my senior year in college, um, just kind of laying the groundwork. And Dr. Greenwood and I kept communication. Um, in my, it was actually really late. Um, I was in my internship with Coach Boyle and late July, I think. School started in August and I was offered the internship. So in two weeks, I was offered the graduate assistantship at Baylor and moved to Texas, uh, never really being out of the Northeast. Um, so luck isn't just about being at the right place at the right time, but also about being open uh, and ready for new opportunities. Uh, takeaways from Dr. Greenwood, be available. If any of you have ever emailed back and forth with Dr. Greenwood, you send your email and then about five to 10 seconds later, you have a return email. Um, same thing goes, away, goes for a phone call. Um, another is advancement requires opportunity. I mentioned what the opportunity did for me in my career. Um, and the profession is very practical in nature, but very academic in origin. So you can tell by you know, his investment in the NSCA um, and what he's doing with state clinics and, and his um, involvement with, with this organization, but um, it, it really does have academic roots. So you know, we, have to, we have to educate ourselves, um, educate others around us in order to keep this progression moving forward. So he's uh, done a great job with that in my life. Um, I don't know if Charlie's here yet, but I warned him that I was putting up a picture of him in a, a kill. So he was, when I was at Baylor, he was a competitor in the Highland Games, so um, that's why I put that on here. And, and he's gone through some injuries because of it. So I have this pyramid on here just because of all these things that, that Charlie kind of exemplified for me. And I know others in the room as well that, that spent some time with Charlie. Um, but he, his groundwork is, is just based around his passion for what he does his passion for his athletes, um, and his passion for those that he comes into contact with every day. So myself um, and, and those others that spend time with him at Baylor, um, his passion leads to his desire, um, his desire to, you know, to get others better, uh, his desire to have an impact, um, to dedication with the athletes. So, you know, being around in, in the summer when a lot of uh, students are off campus, he's in his prime time um, with, with basketball coming back onto campus and starting their summer training. Um, obviously, results and success are at the top. So all these things are building to uh, what Baylor basketball has done, you know, since, well, since he got there, really, and Coach Drew uh, has been there. So um, they've done a great job, and, and, and his time, or my time that I spent with him was, was uh very positive and the takeaways from him were investing in people is not work it's an opportunity so he never he never seemed put out by having um, five to eight graduate students in his weight room trying to help him out um, he was giving you the opportunity you just had to show it uh, passion and purpose is not only visible through action but through character um, and if you meet Charlie you'll you'll see this he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet um, one of the funniest guys you'll ever meet um, if you want it show it is another one um, so the, the people that succeeded under him were ones that, that made the call to him and asked, is there anything I can do? Um, you know, the opportunity to mop your floors, you know, whatever it is. Um, he was big on, you know, showing that you actually want it. Uh, adversity shows true character. So uh, I, I mentioned he was the Highland Games com com competitor. He's torn both quad tendons, I think blown out both shoulders. Um, a ton of time under the knife, but he's always come back and gone back to his roots of, of how he got to, to where, he, where he was. So his competitive nature just keeps driving him back to, to training and his love for strength and conditioning. Um, and the last one, real men can wear skirts and some are willing to sacrifice the health of their body for it. So that's, that's the last takeaway from him. Uh, these last two are, are guys at Florida State who are on the, the, the coaching side. Um, to be a servant leader really is, is my true vision. Um, so to, to lead athletes by, by not feeling like I'm above them, but by serving them, uh, by letting them know that I'm there for them and not there for myself and my advancement. Uh, so Coach Jost at Florida State, he was there. Uh, he was a football strength conditioning coach when Coach Bowden was there. Uh, when Coach Bowden left, he became the director of Olympic uh, strength and conditioning. Um, and he was there for 13 years. He actually just... Uh, I won't say retired because he's probably working harder now than, than he was before, but he's a coffee farmer in Costa Rica. So he bought a coffee farm and now he's, he's growing coffee beans. So that's a lot. 
Um, but these two things, the servant leader believes my success comes from your success. He empowered us every day. You know, as a coach to other coaches, if you're leading people, um, you're empowering them to do their job. Um, so he didn't take the reins away. He was giving us the reins, um, was great in communication. Uh, people buy into the leader before they buy into the vision. And that's a John Maxwell quote. Um, and that's another, another huge thing that Coach Jokes taught me is that, you know, he based everything he did around the vision he had for Florida State Strength and Conditioning uh, and how he wanted his staff. And it was a very well-functioning staff. It was a very young staff. Um, and I think we, did, we had the success that we did uh, because of the athletes, obviously, but because of uh, the relationships that we built. Um, he, he taught me a lot about the administrative side um, of strength conditioning, uh, the, the interaction with ADs, coaches, all of that stuff that, that you never think about until you get there. Um, having strong opinions shows passion and commitment to the cause. Listening and being receptive, receptive to others' opinions shows respect and understanding. Um, but combining the two is not easy. So I've sat in many coaches' meetings um, where coaches are sitting around the table trying to argue what strength conditioning coaches are doing. Strength conditioning coaches are a very passionate, educated group that are doing things based around scientific principles um, that we know to be true, um, anecdotal stuff that we know or think to be true because of what we've, we've done, um, but coaches still, you know, you butt heads. Um, his, his art was to be able to convey his message without burning a bridge, is basically simplifying that. Um, so that's, that's a big thing that I learned from him is just a relationship with, with coaches um, is really of utmost importance to, to keep that moving forward. Um, and he used the leader-leader uh, versus the leader-follower model. So um, as, you, as a leader, you want to develop other leaders. You don't want to develop a bunch of followers. So that's a big thing um, that he had as well. So this last one uh, was the head coach that I worked under for uh, the baseball program, um, Coach Mike Martin. Uh, these things are updated now, I think, since they made another regional this year, but um, he is a huge model of consistency. So he is 71 years old, third winning as coach in Division One baseball, um, 36 years as coach for Florida State. I think it's 37 straight, or 36 straight postseason appearances. It might be 37 and 37 now. Um, he's had 40 plus wins in every season that he's, that he's coached. So this is a 56 game regular season at the college level. Um, then you'll play four to five games in a conference tournament, and if you make anything outside of that um, it, it's bonus obviously to those um, but just crazy that he'd win 40 plus games in every year of his uh, collegiate coaching career um, 15 college world series appearances but zero national championships okay so what this taught me when i was there i sat down with him so much just to learn with him or to learn from him um, you know just little tidbits about coaching you know and these are some of the things I took away. Success isn't just measured by your ability to win games and championships. It's most tangibly measured by your long-term impact on an athlete's physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual development. So even though Florida State's a very secular institution, um, the staff there had a very, a very good spiritual background where they handled athletes from a spiritual background and a non-spiritual background, um, but they had a very good emotional connection with the players. Um, and I think the relationship that they built with those guys really uh, is, is a bigger success than, you know, than any of those games won or national championships just because of um, those guys that they've sent out in the world. Um, you see Buster Posey, probably the biggest name out of Florida State baseball. Um, you see interviews with him, and he just exemplifies what, what Florida State baseball is. You know, he's you know, the most genuine guy uh, in the world, uh, and someone that would give his give his right arm so next one a coach is someone who can give correction without causing resentment so john wooden quote obviously one of the best leaders um, in the coaching profession and then the next is success is neither magical nor mysterious success is natural natural consequence of consistently consistently apl applying basic fundamentals so baseball is a fundamental game like it all comes down to are you able to be consistent um, to win games um, so that's what he has done well he's applied his fundamentals He's pounded his fundamentals. They get on base more than any other team in collegiate baseball, and they score runs in other ways other than home runs. You know, they're consistent in getting on base, and getting on base is the first key to scoring runs. So um, all of these guys have been transformational leaders in my life, um, and a transformational leader has the key to unlock what is in order to discover uh, what can be. So just consider yourself 
more than just a strength coach or more than just a leader of people, you know, in this fitness profession. Try to transform lives is, is kind of what I've learned from people um, in my past that have helped develop my vision, um, then giving me, you know, the chance to go forward and have an opportunity and be able to execute it. So my vision uh, when I got to, to Dallas Baptist, or really when I was at Florida State, when I was over those, those two sports is uh, to serve. So to see the future, engage and develop others, reinvent continuously, value results and relationships, and embody the values. Um, so y'all can think about that, how you would apply that yourself. Um, but that's how I kind of broke it down into, into serving. Um, so you have to know what you want your future to be, you know, what you want or what you're going to require of your athletes, how you're going to build your program. So envision what you're going to do, have your, have your plan, uh, and then be able to execute it. Engage and develop others. So you have to be able to build relationships. You have to be able to pull in those around you, um, you know, to come alongside you, athletic trainers, coaching staff, um, graduate assistants, all of those things. You have to be able to reinvent continuously. Things change. You know, the, the strength conditioning profession is very liquid. Uh, injuries happen, hopefully not because of you, um, but things do happen and you have to be able to reinvent uh, whether it be a progression regression model, whether it be um, your stance on something because of new research that's come out. You know, if you're, if you're not changing every year as a strength conditioning professional, professional or a fitness professional, um, then you're not probably doing enough reading or research. Um, value results and relationships. Obviously, obviously we're in the game to get results. You know, if you don't get results, you come into question. So we need to value those results um, and then value relationships uh, and then embody the values uh, that you see yourself carrying. So um, we, need to, we need to do all of those things as coaches in order to be able to serve. Um, I just put the script, theme scripture of Dallas Baptist University up here just because of what it took for me to be able to go from, to go from Florida State to Dallas Baptist. I do come from a, a religious background. Um, so the, the transition was was uh, a little bit easier for me than probably for, for most people that would be put into that situation. Um, but this scripture really challenged me when the job was offered. Um, not many people would, would leave a place like Florida State to go to a Division II school. Um, but the opportunity was, you know, for me to embrace what I felt like God had laid on my heart to do for people. Um, and then to do for my career. So the opportunity was that. The opportunity was to kind of take a leap of faith um, and still be able to serve people, but in a lot of different ways, hopefully. Um, and, and that was something that, um, that really kind of spoke to me. So I felt like I should, I should put that up there. Um, this was another thing. When I was on the, the plane flight back from my interview at Dallas Baptist, I think it was a strength coach of, of Minnesota, Coach Schuler, I think, put this up, um, and it was like right when I got on the plane, this popped up, and it said, stop waiting for the perfect moment. Instead, take the moment you have and make it perfect, um, and make the big time where you are. So no matter where you are, you can implement what we know to be true um, and impact somebody's life, make them faster, make them stronger, make them more powerful, make them have injury-free seasons of it that they've never had before. Um, and that really spoke to me that, you know, I can do this at Florida State or I can do this at Dallas Baptist. Um, there's pros and cons with each, but either way, um, it's going to come back to making, making the moment perfect wherever you are. So Dallas Baptist, just this is kind of getting into, into the meat of, of what I do there now. 13 NCAA teams. We have 12 Division II teams, one Division I team, um, six athletic department managed club sports. Two of which that we've worked with, myself and my, and my graduate assistant last year. Uh, we might try to transition away from that just to spend more quality time with those NCAA teams. Um, but ultimately, it's 275 athletes for two people. Um, I went from 50, 50 athletes under me at Florida State to this huge number. Uh, luckily, um, as you'll see later, I have a pretty good Excel template that I got from a guy way smarter than myself at Florida State, uh, Dan Schaefer, who helped create what he calls the Super Beast. And you guys would see why it's called that if you see how it functions. Um, but to make it seamless, we have iPads on every rack. So I, I shoot everything out through Dropbox onto iPads um, so that the athlete goes out, pulls up their sport, pulls up their name. Um, they modify the file on an app called GoodReader. So this is just using third-party applications. Modify their stuff sync it, it gets sent back to my computer for their update. So there's no paper flying around, there's no, um, there's no waste, there's no loss of anything. Uh, so it's, it's, it's 
almost essential to have that going on with us with 275 athletes and two coaches. Um, we have one 5,000 square foot facility with six platforms of squat racks. Um, so we're running, you know, 18 person sessions at max. You know, so we're running from six o'clock in the morning through six o'clock at night um, with scheduled sessions. And then outside of that, there's people coming in on their own to club sports. So the execution of all this, how does it happen? Uh, you have to have a plan um, and then you have to execute it. So uh, another quote, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. Um, so you have to have tactics and you have to have a strategy of how you're gonna apply that uh, or else you're just gonna be spinning your wheels in the mud. Um, the importance of execution, I found this, um, this uh, it, it, I guess it was more of a case study than anything. But this uh, corporation, or this, this place sent out a uh, questionnaire to a corporation about execution, uh, planning and execution. Um, it was to around 700 people and the responses came out like this to where 74% of them felt like when a plan was presented, um, it had bad execution. Okay, so when, when a good plan is put in and it's well executed, that only happens 4% of the time. All right, so what you have to do to get put into that situation where you are able to, to implement a good plan and then execute a good plan, you obviously have to work extra hard to do it. All right, you have to have the people around you to be able to, to uh, you know, run the group the way you want it, have it, you know, so that they know exactly the warm up they're leading, the graduate assistant, they know the, exactly the warm up they're leading, they know the first place they're going off of the warm up, they know what they're coaching at the rack, so they have the plan of what they're gonna do or else it's just gonna be noise being yelled in the weight room. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about how we assess our athletes. So Dr. Coleman talked a little bit about um, past injury history being the, the number one indicator uh, and that couldn't be more true. Um, so that's one of the things here. Uh, you have to take into consideration obviously male versus female age. So not only like what they are biologically but their training age as well. So a big transition from all Division One sports, mostly elite athletes, to um, Division Two athletes, where they're they're playing because they love the sport, um, is you're going to have training ages that are a lot lower. So you're going to have to have a regression model or a progression model that starts on a lot lower end of the spectrum in order to teach these that teach these athletes how to move better, um, knowing their medical history. So orthopedic, any medications that they're taking. So it's just simple simple things like um, Accutane. Okay, so people that have you know, pimples. They take this, this prescription called Accutane and it, it, it actually has a very negative effect on training response. So if they're taking something like that and they're getting terrible results in the weight room, you can almost correlate the two, uh, try to find modifications around that. Um, sport and activity history, uh, repetitive activity and pattern overload, those kind of tie in together. Um, so we know certain things about overhead athletes, what we need to do to prevent injury, what we need to watch for. Uh, in certain movements, not programming versus programming. Um, how we're assessing specifically, we're, we'll do some static assessments depending on sport. Uh, I'll go over that in a little bit more detail in a second, the same with functional movement screen. Um, but ultimately, sport specific predispositions don't mean every athlete is the same. So we can talk about baseball players and how they uh, have upper cross and lower cross syndrome, which couldn't be more true, but there's outliers. You know, you have to be ready to program for those outliers um, so that they're obviously able to progress and not be held back to a point where you're just working on prehabilitation exercises uh, where you could actually be making gains. Static assessment, it's the first part of the big, big picture for us. So we're collecting information. We'll do some single leg static assessment. So we're looking at hip positioning, whether they're anterior or posterior. We'll do side view, we'll do frontal view. Um, You'll look at pelvic positioning in, in this stance. You can also just do it in standing and see how their, how their hips are lining up. Uh, we can look at degrees of movement, but it's really the combination of tests that gives a perspective on movement and limitations. So we'll take this static assessment, um, get the feedback from it, uh, and then apply it to possibly something we see in an FMS or something we see just in a dynamic warm-up. Um, is it important? Obviously, single leg is where athletes spend a lot of their time. So when you make a first step, you're only on one leg. Okay, you obviously have to lift one leg to go a direction. So you're gonna spend a lot of time on one leg. Infield or backhand, you're gonna be into a split stance, launching off of one leg to make a throw across the diamond. First step in a steal, 
volleyball player, their approach, um, running, planning, cutting, jumping, all of those things, it's all going to start with one leg. Um, so single leg strength and single leg stability uh, is a huge factor in that uh, in alignment uh, is what we're going to look at in static assessment in order to find um, just some, some basic information. Uh, FMS, in a team setting with 275 athletes, you have to have a huge team effort. Um, you have to have athletic training on board. You have to have graduate uh, assistants on board. Um, so this is a really hard thing to do, so you have to be really organized. Um, but I'm sure we all know about the FMS uh, and how it's assessed. But the big thing about team FMS is I think uh, a big thing that we could be doing is filming. So if you film the FMS, you're able to go back and reference uh, maybe you select a few. The main ones we use are deep squat, hurdle test, shoulder mobility, active straight leg raise, um, everything else we can do if we feel necessary, but those are the ones we mainly use to get uh, what we find to be across the board deficient in our athletes. Um, another idea is just to do it in form of a dynam dynamic warm-up. So to keep things moving without having sessions of functional movement screen that take up three days of your first uh, fall training sessions, do it in warm-ups, film the warm-ups, see how they move in lunging patterns, squatting patterns, things like that. So this I'm going to move pretty quick. Um, this we can reference in, uh, Gray Cook put this out uh, back when he, he came out with the FMS, but this goes over uh, how we break athletes down um, in a performance period. So we look at their functional movement, so their, their ability to move without restriction, pain, or power leaks, um, to functional performance, so the ability for an athlete to exert maximal force in a useful manner over a short period of time. So this is where we look at what exercises are we going to use, um, what are we going to hang our hat on for core exercises, auxiliary exercises to get our volume and hypertrophy, um, if that's a goal of ours, how are we going to progress it, um, what exercises are contraindicated for it, uh, volume and intensity, and then appropriate scheduling and periodization of it. So uh, functional performance is going to have kind of the biggest window uh, of where we're, we're making our application into our uh, program. Functional skill, the ability for an athlete to accomplish the task required for their sport. Uh, what type of athlete do you have and how much time do they spend in their activity? Uh, Eric Cressy did a good video a, a couple years back where he looked at the absolute strength of the absolute speed continuum. So where does your athlete fall on the continuum from? Someone that spends a lot of time on absolute speed to someone that spends a lot of time on absolute strength with speed strength, strength speed in the middle where you have, um, you know, you're, you're marginally loaded or you're 40 to 50 percent with um, medicine ball training, underload training, those kind of things and building yourself back up, you have to recognize where they are. So if they spend the majority of their time on the absolute speed end of the spectrum, um, they're probably really good in, in the functional skill realm, okay? Um, they're, they're probably very skilled. As a baseball player, if you're taking a lot of ground balls um, from age five up until you get to college level with my D1 guys, they're probably pretty proficient in their skill. Um, so what we need to do is to get them a ton stronger. So we need to take them to the absolute strength end of the spectrum. This is mainly off season I'm talking about um, so that we're able to maximize that period. Um, so functional skill, their level is gonna indicate where we need to be with them. Uh, and that's this continuum that, that pops up here um, where we need to start with them in the off season. So this is the pyramid. You're going to have um, an optimal, an underpowered, an overpowered. Um, but this is what it looks like is you have someone with a good base of functional movement, um, functional performance is on point, and their functional skill is at the peak. So you have the base that leads to, you know, a, a obviously very elite functional performance or functional skill base. Um, they're few and far between, you know, at my level. Uh, the, v, the D1 baseball team, more than others, we have some really good athletes, um, but the D2 ones, you have to, to work a little harder uh, to get their functional movement uh, on, on par so that they can move towards that. Um, overpowered performance period uh, is having the ability to generate force in excess of their ability uh, to move freely, causing nagging injuries or a path to injury. Um, so this is where athletes might have spent a little too much time uh, in the weight room um, doing the wrong things, not enough time uh, learning how to move correctly and then applying it to their skill. Um, this is where we need to build up more functional movement, probably go through and, and regress a little bit in order to build back up. Underpowered performance, 
Um, this is possessing excellent movement patterns, but lacking strength and power to perform at an elite level, um, which is kind of self-explanatory. Um, the next one, uh, overpowered. Did we just talk about that one? I'm going backwards. And the underskilled. Um, so this is the last one, where functional movement and functional performance have a huge base, but they just aren't really good at their sport. Um, so those those are the ones that are really frustrating. Is they're they're going off the charts in the weight room. Um, they're some of your strongest athletes. They're jumping through the roof, but they just can't they just can't perform. So those are the ones that that you need to to get doing more skill work. Um, they they might need to to be talked to and say um, in order to, to perform for your team, you're gonna you're gonna have to know what your priorities are. So programming and template uh, progressions and regressions. I'm going to cover a few things, low to high speed, low complexity to high complexity, more external stability to less external stability. So these are things that I look at when I'm progressing exercises. Um, and this picture is, is representing um, not, not trying to do something um, with an athlete that you, that, you, that you know you shouldn't. You put them in their category um, or else you're trying to shoot a cannon out of, out of a canoe. You might be going backwards um, by trying to go too fast too soon. Um, so why would we even think about training athletes with a one-size-fits-all approach uh, with all that we know now? So we need to individualize. Um, with low to high speed, uh, I like to go through periods of isometric, eccentric, and concentric, or controlled concentric training. Um, so have periods of this through my off-season training uh, and, and take it into preseason, um, utilizing all of them. So it's going to get proprioception and body awareness active stability uh, to passive stability, strength and contractions where injury most often occurs. Um, so we know that eccentric contraction is where a lot of injuries, injuries occur. Okay, now whether that has to do with a lot of mechanical deficiency as well, we're gonna address that in some, some uh, warm up and skill work. Um, it also develops connective tissue strength and tendons, ligaments and joints uh, and it mirrors return to play. Um, so this is a big thing that, that helps us with our, with our athletic training uh, staying on the same page is um, is that frame of mind that we need to to work muscle contraction um, and not just area. Low complexity to high complexity, um, we need to have a progression regression model that doesn't force the athlete into situations where it's putting complex movements ahead of stuff that they need to be proficient at before. Um, so I'm going to show you something a little bit uh, here where we have a hip hinging progression talking about, um, I don't know if this will pop up, what we'd use here before we progress to uh, an Olympic lift. Rainbow wheel. Okay, well, while it's doing this, I'll just explain what we do. Um, our hip hinging progression, we're gonna start in a kneeling position. So learning how to hinge your hips from a kneeling position, taking out the lower extremity. Um, we're gonna go on an air X pad. So we'll have our kneeling position. Toes are gonna be dug in so we can fire our glute. Okay, we're gonna go kneeling back, getting our posture right, sticking our hips back, coming up to the top and squeezing our glutes. So learning how to hinge our hips, we can do this with a goblet hold. We can do it just body weight. We can do it with a PVC on our back, um, but that's gonna be our first progression. We'll go into um, the single leg RDL progression where I have a box behind them on a valve slide. Okay, they have a med ball in their hands and they're actually going to slide their leg back on the box instead of having to swing their leg back. So it puts them in a fixed position on the back. Um, have them learn how to properly deadlift uh, or pull from the floor before they go into, a, into their clean. So we know that that in order to learn how to deadlift, we have to know which deadlift is right for them. So putting them in positions where, um, you know, a basketball player isn't going to deadlift the same way uh, as someone that's a lot lower to the ground or has a lower center of gravity. So we're going to use trap bar, sumo, uh, and conventional in order to teach the deadlift or first pull. We can modify from block racks or pins for athletes that have um, higher joints. When we select the clean, if we select the clean, our progression is clean pull from racks, clean pull or from above the knee, below the knee, pull from the floor, power clean from the hang, power clean from the floor, full clean from the hang, and full clean from the floor. Okay, so this kind of ties back to a little bit of the USAW progression. 
um, but it's not putting the athlete into a position where they're going through the whole movement before they learn to master one. More external, external stability to less, less external stability. Um, too often we assume that just because our athletes walk around every day that they have to earn the right to exercise on their feet. Um, I don't think anything could be further from the truth. Most of them lack serious stability. Um, and when you put them into single leg stance position, you can see that. Uh, in this case, you need to dial someone back uh, as far as necessary for them to get some traction on what you actually want them to do. Um, a progression or regression model. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen rolling patterns. I don't think we have a Wi-Fi connection, um, which is why the video isn't popping up. But rolling patterns are, when you think of a, a developmental stage for, for athletes or even babies, they start on their back or their belly and they learn to roll. Then they get into a quad quadruped position. Then they go into a kneeling position. Then they're up onto one knee standing. Okay, so this is thinking in those terms um, and adding in prone and supine positions first in that progression. Um, from uh, the technical, for the technical considerations, we want to make sure prioritized segment is leading the movement, and then focuses on segmental sep separation while maintaining a neutral pelvis. So when we're on our back and we have arms and legs over our head, if we're working lower body rolling patterns, we're trying to keep our upper body basically dead to the ground while our lower body is actually turning and making us rotate. Um, so that's going lower body and upper body. We can use assistance. Um, by using, uh, they call them great cook bands, um, but I suggest you all look into um, rolling patterns as well. We use, for a quadruped position, uh, a bird dog progression where we start, um, we hammer pelvic neutral, so we, we need to find neutral. Uh, we have hands under our shoulders, knees under our hips. In our bird dog progression, we're gonna go upper body first, so we're into that quadruped position, and we're just gonna get into our neutral, we're going to learn how to lift one arm before we're going to learn how to go opposites. Okay, so we're going to go one arm, we're going to go one leg, we're going to go diagonal, then we're going to go same side. So that's our progression on bird dog. Our chop progression, it's pelvic neutral is huge again. We need our toes to dig in to fire the glutes when we're kneeling. Inside leg is forward when we're in a split stance and then the eyes follow the cable or our cord in the chop progression. Chop progression, we're starting in a kneeling position, so two knees on the ground. We're going into a half kneeling position. Like I just said, our inside leg is up and we're going from eyes to follow. We can go rotational or a non-rotational. So like Dr. Coleman mentioned earlier, a lot of our injuries in rotation are in deceleration. So sometimes we need to take the rotation out of a movement and teach the athlete how to resist the rotation first before they can accommodate that kind of rotational force. So in template design, um, this is just gonna be really quick in an off season, it, it, the length is going to vary, so we need to, we need to recognize that, what our priorities are, how long we're going to have to address those priorities. In our postseason, we're going to need, need to be able to rescreen what we screened before. We need to recondition the athlete to a position that we feel we're able to start with and then reload the athlete so that they're able to meet you uh, where you need them when they go into their preseason. Preseason, we're going to, look, going to look at volume and intensity modification. We need to recognize that the athlete with preseason is going to have an increase in skill specific work, uh, which means we need to scale back on, on some volume and intensity needs. Maybe our intensity stays up or our volume goes down, but we just need to recognize something needs to give, and that goes back to our CNS uh, priorities that I mentioned with Coach Boyle. Um, priority shift uh, from rate of force development. Uh, in dynamic effort. So we need to be able to, to tell our athletes this is our goal now. It's not to, to be failing under the bar. Uh, Preseason is our time uh, that we need to be able to have our rate of force development um, at our high. When we go in season, our priority shift again. Uh, patterns, exercises, loading, depending on game situations like Dr. Coleman mentioned, um, are very important to recognize. Sport specific needs analysis, so we need to be able to hinge, we need to be able to squat, we need to be able to upper press, we need to be able to upper pull. So those are our main core exercises. Um, we're gonna pull from bridging and deadlifting, bilateral and unilateral squatting, horizontal and vertical uh, upper pressing. Depending on the athlete, we may stay away from vertical or turn it into more of a, a landmine variation uh, that, that puts them into more of a fixed position, less overhead. Our auxiliary exercises, progression and regression models, uh, need to be able to hand or handle uh, injury sites of, of these athletes. So hip, shoulders, torso, um, some mobility for these athletes that, that all they're doing is doing. So they need to be able to recognize that 
Uh, they need to take a step back at times and, and work mobility of certain areas uh, in order to take the next step forward. Um, volume for strength, hypertrophy, and muscular endurance is going to come from these auxiliary. Um, obviously, we're going to get it from our core stuff as well, depending on our set and rep scheme. Uh, I'm not going to put them under huge volumes um, for my athletes anyways in my position uh, in, in many of those exercises. We're going to work those core exercises in, in, in strength loads, probably more in like the one to five range, um, depending on the time of year. Power selection, priority, we need to master the sagittal plane before addressing uh, the frontal and transverse plane. So unless they know how to extend their, their ankles, knees and hips from front to back, they're not going to be able to recognize what needs to fire in order to rotate, what needs to fire in order to go laterally. Um, so we use plyometric progressions, single leg box jumps, single leg hurdle hops, bilateral box jumps, bilateral hurdle jumps. Med ball progressions are huge for us. Um, tall kneeling, half kneeling, standing, split stance, all of these different progressions um, that can put your athlete in a position where they always feel like they're doing something different, um, but you're able to see see uh, progression really easily. Olympic, we have our hip hinge clearance, so what we need to do in order to, to say that they are able to, to go forward with Olympic lifting because they're able to hinge their hips, put themselves in positions that we know um, they need, and they're learned through complexes. So we never have athletes go to a clean variation without first showing us that they can do it with a PVC pipe or a bar in a complex manner. So having RDL shrugs, um, high pulls, clean or a clean front squat, those kind of things that are parts and pieces of the full movement. So here's a sample template. So this is using the Excel sheet that, that Dan Schaefer made at Florida State. Um, we have some really strong guys um, at, at DBU. This guy's sheet that's up now, Daniel, Sal Daniel Salters is our catcher. Um, he's going to be probably a pretty high draft guy this year. Um, I don't know if it's smart or not. I mean, sometimes I do things in the weight room to guys that are overly strong just to see what they can do. But we were in uh, a block where we were working kind of max strength, um, rear foot elevated. Um, we were, I think we're, we were doing for fours. Um, and Daniel put on uh, 355 and did four on each leg. For Bulgarian, so super, super strong dude, um, and really made it look really easy. So his his back squat max is 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 right up there. So you can see my my priority list here. So I have it uh, numbered one A, one B. So we're working a clean pull paired with band pull throughs, uh, kind of to, to to maximize activation of hip extension through glute contraction um, with that pair of band pull throughs. So the clean pull is going to be fairly light here. They're just learning technical proficiency. Um, and then our front squats are our strength exercise or our core exercise for the day. Um, our next one, we're pairing clamshell series, so a hip prehab with a band-resisted lateral lunge. Um, glute ham raise, front foot elevated split squat hold. So you can see different muscular contractions being trained throughout the day. So we're ending with an ISO um, and then finishing with some linear sled runs. Um, second day, this is more of an upper body. Um, so this is where we had four day, a four-day template. So we're, we're starting with some shoulder prehab, um, some scapular positioning stuff with band lat stretching. Um, then we're going to my main exercise with baseball to start any upper body day is, is a pull. Um, as Dr. Coleman talked about, we know that these athletes need to pull more than they need to press. Um, so a pen lay barbell row, we're pulling directly from the floor. Um, so rather than, than rowing from a hang position, we're actually getting the athlete pulling from the floor so they're locked into this position so that they're not jerking themselves up and down. So they're locking in and working that mid-back specifically. Um, then they'll go into push-up variations, field goal rotations. So this is just a T-spine uh, mobility exercise and finishing with some Kaiser work. Uh, day three, deadlift day with some dynamic squat afterwards, uh, dumbbell acceleration lunge, stability while hip bridge holds, uh, plank, hip flexor, um, pistol squats, so we're, we're working both single leg and bilaterally through this day. Um, auxiliaries are going to be higher, uh, volume with lower intensity. Day four, towel pull-up, foam roll, pec mobility, split stance, landmine press, inverted row, yoga push-up, side plank, external rotation. Um, a lot of these, I mean, they, you may call them different things, um, but we're probably, a lot of us, doing the same thing. Um, but ultimately, the template development is all going to be based around what you believe to be your core exercises that you're going to hang your hat on. 
um, have conviction about it, be able to explain it to your coaches, be able to coach it, and be able to master the basics. Um, because without you know being a, a, a master of, of something as essential as a body weight squat, they're not going to get anything out of a loaded squat. Um, so we need to be able to recognize what we need to do uh, for our core exercises. Um, so like I just said at the end of the day, majority of us are doing the same stuff, just delivering in different ways. So the goal is to, to know who you are as a strength coach, recognize those that came before you, that, that made you who you are, um, and then to, to, to recognize that you can then you know, pay it forward to those athletes and serve them um, with the knowledge that you gain from education, um, your mentors, all of those different, different things in your life. Um, and passion for the profession is not just about liking to write and implement programs, which is what I've learned a, a, a lot uh, in, in my career thus far. It's about having a dedication to serve your, every athlete that steps, your, steps foot into your facility. Um, so if you're just a guy or, or, or a woman that, that likes to, to write programs um, for your athletes, write your program and then go do it. Coach yourself doing it. You know, that's where you learn a lot of how your program works um, is by being able to, to recognize what the athlete's going through, uh, have a passion for more than just the writing of the program, deliver, uh, deliver, deliver for that athlete so that they're walking out of there um, knowing that you gave everything you had for them. So, um, any questions? I left my contact information. Uh, if anyone wants these slides, I might have to cut out um, for a game, but I'll leave my, uh, I'll leave a stack of business cards up here on the front with my contact information if anyone wants uh, to see this a little bit more in depth. I know I moved pretty quickly through some of it, um, but if they're not posted online, I can get them to you, uh, no problem. Any questions? Dr. Greenwood.